This conference will now be recorded. And I also want to let you know that we also will have several members of the media uh, in monitoring this call as well. I'd respectfully ask all of you to put your phones and your computers on mute until we're ready for questions. Uh, I also want to remind you that the Chamber has a wealth of information located on the Chamber website at www.nacodotras.org. Please visit the COVID-19 resource page for that information. We update that uh, several times during the course of the day. Uh, I also uh, have the honor this morning of interviewing, introducing our first our presenter this morning. Uh, David Carasales is a Vice President of Global Services for eTech. David is here to share how eTech has prepared and managed through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, he'll also help us understand how preparation and planning can help us prepare for the unexpected. Uh, his positive attitude has been contagious. David's ability to inspire and motivate people is outstanding. Uh, since I've been here uh, in Nacogdoches, I've got to tell you that uh, he's one of those guys that when he posts as a Facebook friend, I always take the time to read his post because I always feel better as a result of his insightful observations about life, living, and working. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome David Carasales to start us off this morning. David? Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Wayne. That was for the kind words. That was very nice. I appreciate it very much. And and good morning to everybody. And uh, um, uh, I, I'm so grateful and blessed and thankful that uh, you guys would allow me the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you this morning. And especially coming off of Memorial Day, where we are all very blessed to have the opportunities we have for all those that have done the things for us so we can have the freedom to have these meetings. So, um, I'll just kind of get started with you. You know, when Wayne uh, gave me the topic, new world, new opportunities, I thought that was kind of perfect because I think we've all heard or or the phrase that's been out there, uh, the new normal, the new normal. And and I I, I laugh at that sometimes because I don't know how, how new of a normal this feels or I want it to continue to feel, but, um, or if I ever want it to be this normal. I have loved the fact that uh, when people use their cameras and I see a name, I'm like, oh, that's so and so, you know, instead of saying, hey, guy, you know, so that's been kind of helpful uh, to see some names in there, do some screenshots so I can remember people when I see them out and about. But this morning, I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you and talk about a couple of things. And, um, you know, I, I, as Wayne said, I, I'm, I'm a studier. I, I read and I study and I look for facts and I look for different things to try to help me you know, pave way and understand where I'm headed and what I'm doing. And, and I came across this quote from Thomas uh, Paine. And if you don't know who that is, he's a political, he was a political activist and um, he actually wrote uh, two of the most influential pamphlets before the uh, American Revolution. And in all of that, I, uh, and yes, I'm, it might be strange. I read all those things, and uh, but there was a quote in there that says, "These are the times that try people's souls. These are the times that try people's souls." And I thought, "Wow, you know." Um, and, and a lot through those pamphlets, they talk about crisis and and understanding and where we're headed. And um, you know, I could say right now that we're in the middle of a crisis. And what I've learned. Uh, from talking to people and, and, and really spending some time with folks one-on-one -on -one is that everybody's definition of what this crisis is, is completely different. Uh, for some, it's the virus itself. And for others, it's, hey, I have to be locked in my house and I need people. Um, and for uh, others, it is uh, my small business is hurting. I don't know if I'm going to reopen. I don't know what I'm going to do. So you, you can guess that there is so much uh, debate on what is right and what is wrong. And so I always say a little prayer for our leaders because I think it's extremely difficult to make those decisions. And and I'm not here to debate what, what is and what is, and I'll tell you that much, but just to talk to you a little bit about what we did and what we are doing currently at eTech. Um, and how this really came to be was Wayne, uh, Kelly had reached out to me because Wayne drove by eTech and he was like, there's no cars in the parking lot. What the heck's going on over there? Are they working? Are they shut down? What is happening? 
Um, and so I, I can just start out by telling you, happy to tell you that we are still fully functional and operational. And in February, uh, when we started seeing this happen, uh, we sat down as a leadership team and started to make some plans. Now we have contingency plans for everything. We have contingency plans for uh, network issues. Uh, we One of the things that we do when we talk to clients is talk about redundancy. If one of our sites goes down, we the other site will pick it up. Um, we talk about uh, being able in, in inclement weather contingency plans. We had some this weekend where uh, one of our sites went down, um, so the generator kicks on. So we have contingency plans that if one or two of our sites go down, you can imagine being global, we have different situations. Jamaica, we hurricanes uh, come. You know, India, we have issues. And so um, we have contingency plans really to, to assess and, and handle what we need to happen. But did we did not have a contingency plan for what happens if with the possibility that we might have to shut down every single site we have because of a shelter in place. And that's exactly what really happened. We It started in Florida, it went to India, we had it in Jamaica, and then of course in Texas. And every single one of those sites, as you can imagine, in the areas that they were located had different rules that we had to follow as it pertained to whether or not we were gonna be open. So we sat down as a team in late February and said, what does this look like? What are we gonna do? And how are we going to allow the opportunity to stay open? Now, um, if you can see my jacket, it says servant leadership. So we we are a servant led organization. We we focus primarily on you know the needs of others. How can we meet the needs of others? And as you can imagine, we had uh, still goals for 2020 that our clients said, hey, you know I I get it, but we still have goals that need to be met and things that need to actually happen. So as a team, we sat down and we came up with three priorities that we felt like we were going to focus on no matter what. And, and we were going to communicate that to our clients and the community and our agents and our team members and say, this is what it's going to be. And priority number one was the safety of our people. That was priority number one. We are going to focus on the safety of our people. Priority number two was the safety of their families. It's really and then important. priority number three was to continue to allow to work. in the background while I did the brief. Uh oh. Um, but it's like E-Tech. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Okay. <laughs> Please make sure your microphones are on mute with the exception of David. Go ahead, David. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so we um, we we again the, the third priority was really the livelihood of our folks, right? We want to make sure that we continue to allow them the opportunity to work, because uh, you know that was extremely important. And in anxiety kind of set in because folks were thinking, "Gosh, we're going to close down, and what am I going to do?" And so we went to work on what that contingency plan looked like, and sure enough. In mid-March, we started to see our sites having to shut down. Uh, so what we essentially did is we did a survey, first of all, and we made a determination of uh, how many people could work from home. Number one, do you have internet at your house? That was the main priority. Uh, do you have the capacity and the capability of actually being able to work from home? We were happy to say the majority of the folks did. Um, the second piece was we don't need you to have a computer we're just going to give you ours so we sent all our computers home now a lot of people have asked were you worried about you know what's going to happen when your computer gets to their house well sure we are but you know there's a trust piece in there that you have to kind of rely on your folks you're going to do what needs to be done and the next part was compliance and security there's a lot of rules and regulations that we have to follow to make sure that uh, we are doing what we need to do for our clients and to protect our clients, ETEC, and of course our agents as well. So we went into to work with all those contingency plans and I'm happy to say that by mid-March, we had sent 90% of our workforce home and able to work from home. Uh, the other 10%, um, to give you kind of an idea of what that looks like, in uh, Nacogdoches, there's 500 seats there. 
where people can work. Uh, we have on any given moment about maybe 40 people there that we're able to social distance. And the only reason they're there is because they can't work from home. Uh, we were deemed essential as far as our programs that related uh, directly with telecom, which was uh, like our Verizons, our AT&Ts, our Spectrums, campaigns like that. Um, we have a couple of government programs that actually are deemed essential as well. But again, if we could send you home, we were sending you home. Uh, going back to our priority number one, which was the safety of our people. So we sent a majority of the folks home. And uh, I will tell you this, it's it's kind of interesting because in April, uh, we, we, we have a goal of 93% retention. We wanna retain at least 93% of our people. We know we're gonna lose folks across the sites because of graduation or they move or personal reasons. In April, we had 98% retention. We re we retained 98% of our workforce. And uh, the other good news to that is, is that we actually uh, hired. We actually started two brand new campaigns. Um, we hired about 60 people in Nacogdoches um, and we hired about 60 people in Lufkin. Um, we started a new program in Jamaica and all of this was trained and, and interviewed and done remotely where we didn't have to have anybody come into the site because again we wanted to make sure they were safe and also make sure that uh we kept their families safe and so all of that planning what does that tell you uh we go back to our, our focus really is um we we work as a trusted advisor group with our clients more of a partnership you know our vision is to make a remarkable difference for each other and for our community and our clients in working in a trusted advisor capacity, it was extremely important to communicate and be very open and honest about our intentions, which was one to, for our clients again, and I, I'm gonna beat that into you, we kept telling them safety of our people first. Uh, we had some clients that maybe said, hey, we, we need you to be here. Well, we can't be here because it's not safe and we're not gonna do it. Um, and so we all figured out solution, you know, there's a solution to every problem and, and no figure when you throw that out there, everybody was ready to find a solution on how we could actually get our for workforce home, which we did. Uh, so I'll tell you, you know, we, I, I work a lot on, on what's called a trust equation from a trusted advisor book. If you've never read it, read it, Google it, it's called trusted advisor. And uh, really the trust equation says uh, that trust is equal to credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation again credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation equals trustworthiness and the credibility and reliability was there because we had done so much work with our clients and and our people so we had that but this the the bigger parts of this piece was intimacy was spending a lot of time in communication. We, we are over communicating with our agents and our clients about what we're doing, the moves we're making, why we're doing it. Um, it is, it, you know, some will say, wow, that's a lot of information, but it, it knowledge is power here where people, we can ease that anxiety by telling them, here's why we're doing and here's what we're doing, especially with all the news reports that are coming out and all the different information that's pouring out. Uh, we're really trying to make sure that everybody understands here's what we control and here's what we're going to do because i can't control all the other things that are currently happening out there i can only control how we influence and impact our our folks here so having some really intentional conversa intimate conversations with our stakeholders and our agents and everybody to make sure they understand where we are and of course the denominator is self-orientation and that's a, a, the only denominator for a reason self-orientation basically is it's not about us it's for the greater good. We're not doing it for one person. We're not doing it for one client. We're trying to make sure that we're doing everything uh, with the thought process that it is uh, not about one person. It's for the greater good. And, and when we do that and we fall all the way back to what I talked about, our priorities, keeping um, our team members safe, keeping their family safe and making sure they continue to have an opportunity to earn and, and to, to earn a living. Uh, that's what we did. So as we, we move into May, the question has been, what was, are we going to open up? And I can tell you, a lot of folks don't want to come back. They like working from home. Um, our utilization is through the roof because you can roll out of bed and go to work. 
and that's a nice thing. I'm at home right now, and uh, you know, I I the the only problem I have is shutting down um, or remembering that I've been sitting here for eight hours and my legs don't work anymore. So I I I remember things like that halfway through the day that I need to move, um, and so the just we do a lot of uh, seminars. We do a lot of uh, classes throughout the day to break up the monotony for our folks. Um, on Friday, we were really blessed to have a global meeting where we had a majority of our workforce join us. Uh, we talked about Q1 results. We talked about fun. We answered questions. Matt Rocco um, from Florida was able to get on, talk to us about different things. We sang him happy birthday because his birthday was Monday. I mean, was Saturday. So it's just making sure that you're continuing to interact and to work with them and being intentional in the things that you're doing um, has really been uh, uh, the big part of this planning process for us. So uh, a lot of questions from the community have been, are you guys going to open back your doors up, start bringing people back? The answer is we're in absolutely zero hurry to do that. Um, we're going to take it one day at a time. Um, we're not looking at um, of pulling anybody back into the site uh, unless they need to be, um, so they continue to work. But at this point, we're going to continue business as usual, let the folks work from home, um, and uh, be blessed that we can do that. And so uh, I, my time's up, but I'll leave you one last thing. I'm a jo big John Maxwell person. If you can see this book, this is a great book. It's called Leadership. Um, it's a really, 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 really good book. And I love John Maxwell and I read all his stuff. And um, one of his, my favorite quotes from John Maxwell is character makes trust possible. And trust is the foundation of leadership. Character makes trust possible and trust is the foundation of leadership. And as uh, all of, as I look at all the leaders that are on this call, um, it's exciting to know that there's so much um, knowledge and faith and blessings and trust in this group that really kind of allows us the opportunity as leaders in what we do uh, to ease the anxiety of our folks out there and create a trust that we're gonna do all the things necessary to make sure that they're taken care of. So it's a good time. Um, as Wayne says, it's new opportunities to do things that we've done, but do them better than we did yesterday. And I'm really excited about the continued opportunity to do so. So thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm gonna mute myself so I can listen to all of the great information that you guys have. And Wayne, uh, Kelly in the chamber, thank you so much uh, for giving me a few minutes this morning. I appreciate you. Well, thank you very much, David, for that uh, inspiring uh, presentation. It's great to hear that eTech students as well. Just wanna show you my my mouse pad, see, I'm all equipped this morning. So, uh, and I appreciate that offer that you made to me before the call to go to, go to Jamaica to police the beaches. Yes, yes. E -tech. I'll, I'll try to run that by the board to see if I can get a. Uh, yes, get an offer. most yeah. definitely. I see my well, chairman I, of the board shaking her head no. So apparently I'm not going. <laughs> no. that, so, so. Well, I will do this, Wayne. Um, you have all my contact information and. In, in, Guys, if you have in, you know, you any questions or or any information, or you know, folks that are sitting out there right now that maybe need an opportunity, um, you know, by all means, uh, we we were blessed to hire uh, some teachers during this time. Teaching was still going on hardcore. Trust me, my 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 kids were were on Zoom after Zoom, and God bless our teachers because my goodness gracious, uh, I, I yeah, I'm. Anyway, my kids aren't the best. That's all I'll say. But uh, so God bless our teachers. And uh, but I'll tell you this, too, that um, a lot of the subs, you know, couldn't sub. There was no need for them to sub. And so we were able to really uh, provide some job opportunities for a bunch of them. Um, we really worked on and are perfecting a bring your own device, you know, have your computer from home. We put what we need on it. Um, but we were able to employ some some teachers and some different things there. Um, so again, if you have some folks that are sitting out there that need an opportunity or uh, have them reach out, you know, I can't promise anything, but I certainly uh, will do my due diligence to figure out what I can do for them. Uh, a lot of leaders on here, I saw Gary Lee and Caroline and groups like that, that, you know, if we need, if they need any help beyond jobs. Uh, we have a lot of organizations out there that are, have, have given and continue to give. And it's, it's just amazing to see a community such as Nacogdoches have the opportunities to do those things. So 
Um, again, I, Wayne, you have my info. Uh, if anybody needs it, reach out to Wayne. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm sitting here in front of this computer for eight hours. So have a great day. Thanks. We appreciate that, David, very much. Anybody have any questions for David? If not, we will move ahead with the agenda. Again, thank you very much, Dave, for all you folks are doing at eTech. And uh, we really appreciate uh, your willingness to come on board and deliver uh, uh, such a positive message in uh, such a challenging time for all of us. It, uh, it certainly helps to inspire us to, to reach a little higher. And I appreciate that very much. I'm pleased to welcome this morning uh, our state representative, Travis Clardy. Uh, Travis is doing a great job in his. Uh, his Friday briefings and uh, Travis, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, David, thank you for that presentation this morning. I think we all needed a pep talk coming out of the uh, Memorial Day weekend. That was a very, very good. Um, and I got to tell a story on Judy from last night. Uh, you know, this has been kind of an up and down roller coaster for two months. And about the time you go out and you feel good about things, you come and you flip on the news, you hear all the terrible stories. And it wasn't bad enough. We had murder hornets. Now apparently we have cannibal rats. And so it's it's one thing then it's another, but Judy flipped on the TV last night and an old Disney movie was on the Disney Plus channel that we've got, uh, and you may have heard of it. Pollyanna came on, the old movie with Haley Mills, the little girl. And Judy turned and looked at me, this forlorn, hopeful, but optimistic look and said, I really need to watch Pollyanna now. So. I think we've all felt that way uh, throughout this ordeal that there are times we need a little Pollyanna in our life. And, and so David, uh, you aren't pollyanna is, but you were very, very good with your comments. And, and you know, we've all said this throughout the last several weeks. Uh, this is the time that we need to be a little more gracious with each other. Uh, Sherry's done a great job making this comment. Uh, let's be more, more uh, respectful. Let's be kinder. Let's let some small slides just go by, let it slide. It's not important and we'll get through this field together. But uh, let me give you a report what's going on in the district. That's some very good news. I spent this weekend talking with the Freedoms, the Division of Emergency Management, and then Dishes, and because it was transferred, the, the Texas uh, Department of Corrections Criminal Justice. Uh, so as you know, we had a case in the jail. Uh, Jason Bridges, our sheriff, got on that immediately once that was identified and tested and confirmed. Uh, you know, our sheriff in uh, Gray County, Max Seriano, accepted that patient, accepted that inmate. So he's out of our jail because we're already just not equipped with that older facility to take care of that. So uh, uh, we are lined up for tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, Tatum with through, through TBJC or CJ will uh, be coming in tomorrow to test every person currently housed at the Nacogdoches County Jail and also will be uh, testing all the staff. And again, that's a place where we truly do have a captive population. Uh, the, it moves by coming, people coming in and out. Uh, we know that this uh, one uh, person was around people in kind of the general population. So, you know, we're hoping that we won't have many cases, but it's pretty reasonable to expect that we may have additional cases that we can deal with it and isolate it and move forward. They'll come out, do hygiene measures, et cetera. So, uh, come and I appreciate Judge Sal also is helping with that. So, you know, They've done, done everything right that they possibly can, and, and that's what uh, people are learning to do and adjust uh, to the circumstances. So that's happened. We did complete the testing at the Pilgrim's plant last week. We don't have the results yet. There has been a lag time in getting those back because of the volume of tests that are being performed. Getting the swab is one thing, but getting the results back and, and uh, good data uh, is taking a little longer than we hoped. And I know that our staffs at a statewide level are trying to address that. Uh, other things uh, that have occurred, uh, you know, the, the numbers really have stayed good from what I've seen. Um, as we get that report locally from the from the state, but again, time will tell. Right now, frankly, I'm optimistic because we've not seen this big bubble from first opening and from Mother's Day. There have been some additional cases, but the trend seems to be flattening out. The trend that is increasing is the number of recovered cases. Those who were affected had some symptoms uh, relatively mild, but have now come out to where they're not tested positive and are no longer contagious. I think that's the expectation. Some of that is done not through active testing, but through extrapolation. So, but again, that's that's the, the two numbers I think I'm watching more than anything is the numbers of recovered and how that's increasing 
and the number of hospitalizations. Both of those trends are, are positive for us in this part of the world. Um, and then we'll look again if we keep going where we're going. And then uh, uh, I think the governor will have a, some additional loosening of the restrictions come next Monday. So uh, on June the 1st. And then we'll obviously see what happens about a week or so after that, after Memorial Day weekend, or folks moving around uh, and see what kind of effect we have there. So, uh, but right now, I really do think that. Uh, uh, we're having we're having good good numbers, good good work, and uh, I think we're all pulled together. And I will tell you just anecdotally, I went over last week, Wayne, uh, to your counterpart Peggy Renfro at the Cherokee County Chamber, and did a little walking tour of Commerce Street, kind of their main drag for for local businesses, and went in and out of several stores, saw a bunch of people, and and I think this is true in Nacogdoches. Uh, I think it's true throughout uh, our part of the world. Folks are ready to get back. To normal folks were ready to get back and see each other and talk but now on this tour i will say there wasn't a whole lot of hugging a lot not a lot of party handshakes uh people were still maintaining their distance being careful but there was a genuine warmth and and i think happiness that things that were getting adjusted that we've adapted in many ways to this this uh the so-called new normal and uh but i'm, I'm uh, encouraged by that and i appreciate our chambers really leading the way uh to help make that possible so uh, with that uh, wayne i would yield back any time i may have and uh, be certainly happy to answer any questions any questions for representative clarty hey representative this is tim monzingo it's a daily sentinel Hello, i just kind of wanted to hey how, how are you doing all right good good um i was just gonna you know i know the the issue with cases in nursing homes and the reporting by the state and how that is spreading it has kind of been a um, a significant topic in the spread of it in long-term care facilities and things like that can you can you talk at all about what approach the the state is taking to that reporting and then uh, the response now yeah yeah and uh, i don't know if anybody saw fox sunday uh there was uh I can't remember his name right now offhand but he was he's the president of the american Healthcare association which is the national organization for nursing homes uh, and he said it well, that well, they're trying to work into an area, which by the way, we're dealing with right now. Judy's dad is in, uh, uh, had a fall, broke his hip, not his hip, but his leg. We're having, you know, he's going through rehab. We, we get him back to assisted living, we still can't go visit him. So we're trying to visit by FaceTime. So a lot of us are probably going through that with, with friends or family, um, and they're trying to move in that direction. And really what they're doing is taking kind of a regional approach. Um, and there are parts of the state, parts of the country that have not been that greatly affected. And they also know they don't have infection within their facilities and they're going to try to ease back into those kind of visits. That's a, a, a top concern. Um, I will say I'm a little frustrated by what we did in Texas. And I was talking about this back in early March when all of this was coming up. We dealt with it better in the prison populations, but there are elderly populations. We just didn't it was pretty simple to me that we needed to limit ingress, egress, test the people there, make sure it's not already in the building, then be very strict on who comes in and out and make sure there's not a lot of cross contamination the way some of these companies work. Um, again, you know, if, if we've had a, a spread of an infectious disease in a level one trauma center with trained healthcare professionals, it's pretty unrealistic to expect that it's not going to spread within a nursing home environment. Uh, it's just the nature of, of that hands-on type of uh, activity that you have. So, uh, but we finally got to where I think we, we are testing all of our nursing homes throughout the state, both residents and and uh, uh, staff. And so I'm hoping that we can continue to shrink that population of affected, affected facilities. Once it gets into a place and if it's been there without detection, that's where we've seen these tragic circumstances like in originally in Kirkland, Washington, and in some of the local nursing homes. I know in, in Marshall, they've had a problem, and Panola County have had a problem. We've had some here in Nacogdoches. It's just, it's a, you know, that's an environment, unfortunately, that virus uh, thrives in. So, um, but I think we're really doing a better job of interdiction, identification, and through continued testing. I think we're on the right track. And I will say- Any other questions? Like, since I have the microphone, Wayne, I would remind everybody, um, if you want to, you'll get the chance to see me again this Friday, three o'clock on Facebook Live. We've been doing that uh, program, promoting that out. We'd love for you to jump on. If you have questions you think of later, 
well, put that, uh, write that down. You can talk to me Friday at three. And by then we'll have some additional data and, and, and kind of go over the numbers again and see where we are. So, uh, but thank you everybody for participating and I will turn off my Representative, mic. Representative we, Clardy, Donna McCollum here with KTRE. Um, I, I wanted to go hello, back Donna. to the, um, I, I wanted to go back. Uh, I don't have ahead, my camera. I can't see you, but I don't have you my camera on. Because I don't have my makeup on. Oh, that's no excuse. That's no excuse <laughs> with this crowd. Donna. That's no excuse. I'm on here without makeup, and uh, so uh, you know. But that's okay. If I got to talk to a television reporter, okay, there, with you the audio, there you go. There you go. Hey, I, I, I see you. I want. Let me pick. Let me back up a you little love, bit, love. and I may be out of. I may, I may be out of the loop a little bit. Explain to me why the inmate had to go to Gregg County, and if there are more uh, cases, will they have to be sent out too? I don't. I'm. I, you may have answered okay. that in the past, but I've it, been out of town. It's pretty simple. Okay. Don, it's a great example of how East Texas had pulled together. Uh, so the case was the the wife of the of the uh, detainee inmate accused. I'm not sure what you call somebody in jail pending prosecution. Uh, but in any event, that his wife tested positive. She called the jail, which was a good, responsible thing to do. So I've been tested positive. He may test positive. He was then tested based upon that information and proved to be positive. Our older jail facility is really not set up to deal with that situation. It was fine back in the day. It was built within current, current or then jail standards. But the Longview Gray County Jail has a much better facility. And so Jason Talkamaxi, the sheriff up there, great guy, who, like I mean, we've encouraged everybody to do, said, yes, I can help. Let's transport your pay, uh, pasta patients to our jail where we can you can put them over there where they have some cases and keep them isolated and away from the other general population. That works fine for one. And that's when I started calling teams and the others saying, we need to test our jail because I don't want to drag our feet in two or three weeks that one case has turned into 20 or 30 because i think it's the uh, uh we've indulged on our neighbor in gray county enough but we don't need to say hey we've got another 20 25 cases tested positive that's possible i suppose i think it's unlikely but the best way to do that is to get the testing done so that's happening tomorrow uh but that's that really he was sent up there where he could receive better treatment be cared for better and likewise protect our current remaining Nacogdoches population and the and the and our staff and jailers who have that same risk. So that may not be the protocol followed for any future cases. I would imagine it'd be something like that, Don. If we have additional cases in the jail, and again the facility can't change. You know, we have an older aging uh, uh, jailhouse. So if we have positive cases, we'll probably see that some sort of um, uh, you know transition to move them out because we really can't as it's been explained to me and i'm on for the record i am personally not familiar with the nacogdoches county jail not having spent any time there just want to make that clear uh so but i've been told that it is not uh just drawn it's not designed to, to a lot of open space a lot of open areas and just it's not fixed to keep someone with a highly contagious disease so we would probably make the same same sort of arrangements to whether Gray County could do it be somewhere else. I don't know. But let's just cross our fingers and hope that because of Jason's quick action uh, and the quick testing, hopefully the turnaround, we won't have that problem. But you know, we're doing, I think they're doing everything they possibly can. Okay, thank you. Thanks, hey, Don. Donna, you're welcome to call me if you have other questions and other things. And it's okay. great, to see you, great to see you this morning. Nice to see you. I like your haircut. Well, thank you. All Thank right. you, Representative Clardy. We really appreciate that briefing. And again, uh, any of our callers, they've invited us to, to loop back with them. And if you have any question about their numbers, give us a call at the chamber. We'll be glad to we'll be glad to uh, to provide that information for you. I'm pleased to welcome this morning representing the hospitality industry, uh, the director of the Nacogdoches Convention and Visitors Bureau, Sherry Morgan. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well and uh, had a pleasant Memorial Day weekend. So I have a really quick report this week. To recap, our hotel occupancy numbers for the month of March, when we first started to see a, a decline in, in shutdowns and self-quarantining, um, our numbers, hotel occupancy numbers were down about 21%. 
We just recently got uh, the April numbers from Smith Travel Research, which is the metric that we use to gauge our uh, occupancy and average daily rates. And for the month of April, when everything was fully shut down, uh, we were down 41% over um, April of 2019. And while both of those numbers are dreadful, they are not as dreadful as they could be. So that along with the number of visitors that we have seen uh, come through the visitor Charles Bright Visitor Center here, we are now going into our fourth week of being open. We were one of the first visitor centers in the state to reopen um, utilizing best practices and um, you know special circumstances and in, in hours. Um, but we've been seeing a lot of people the very first week uh, we saw about 20 people during the week and then on that Saturday alone we saw like 22 people. Uh, I know this past Saturday I worked two and a half hours in the morning um, at the front desk and I saw 15 people and then Mike Bay came in after me and I haven't checked his numbers to see how many more people that we saw on Saturday. So it's really, really encouraging um, to see that there are people coming in. If you drive by the Fredonia, you can see their parking lot is more full than it has been in the past month. And um, I, I, I'm, we're by no means out of the woods yet, but if the first full month of when everything was shut down and travel, uh, non-essential travel was at, at a standstill, if that was down 41% for us, then um, we are in better shape than I honestly had anticipated. I was really looking to see April numbers be anywhere from high 60s to low 70% down. Um, so anyway, that's good news for us and stay the course. Um, we always, in any destination, it's known as the summer slump. And it seems counterintuitive because you would think that summertime is when more people do vacation and travel. Uh, but usually we see a downward trend in occupancy in a normal year right after SFA's graduation. Um, we see more day trips there. So if you look at uh, our sales tax numbers, we'll, you know, those will be slightly higher um, during the summer because we do get more people that are driving through and stopping off and visiting in that in that manner. Um, but ideally, uh, probably around July, that's when we start to see an upward trend in a normal year. So um, we still have things to look at. We're still keeping an eye on the number of reported cases and the number of, you know, the testing that we're doing. Um, if you take a look at the national news and are keeping track of that, uh, you know, there are several people that forecast a, forecast a second wave uh, in the fall, and so we're always keeping an eye on the ready so that we don't rest on our laurels and that we learn from what we've learned from this, this first wave um, so that we are in a better position to respond if and when a second wave does occur. But that ends my report. Thank you very much, Sherry. I really appreciate that. And Sherry and I will be hosting... Uh, in the near future, a meeting of the restaurant tours at their request uh, to help them with some best practices information and answer some of their questions. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome this morning the president of the Stephen F. Austin State University, uh, Dr. Scott Gordon. Uh, good morning, Dr. Gordon. Good morning. I hope everybody is doing well. And uh, I am convinced that uh, this week is going to be a much better week than last week. Um, a few things that I do want to uh, mention. So I have a very short uh, presentation this morning. Um, first, our uh, spring commencement, which is going to be completely virtual, um, will be uh, up and live beginning at 6 a.m. May 30th. So that's this Saturday in that commencement ceremony. Um, there will be a link on our, our website and uh, it'll be up for a significant period of time so uh, folks can watch it over and over and over. Um, our summer enrollment continues to be very positive. Um, as of this morning, we were up a little over 9% for um, summer, uh, total summer 
So that again has been trending upward. So we're really pleased with, with that. Um, just a reminder in uh, three to maybe four weeks, we'll have a complete comprehensive update for our uh, fall plans. And uh, we're, we're working our way through what's being termed the uh, lumberjack flex model or jack flex model. We haven't come up with our uh, specific name yet. Um, most of our students have already moved out from their um, residence halls. As you recall, we had a, um, a slow uh, process where students would move out in a socially distant manner, process that was approved by the uh, CDC, well, not the CDC, the uh, State Health Department and uh, Governor's Office. And so that's been going uh, pretty smoothly. Um, I will say, though, um, something that is uh, pretty, uh, um, interesting is our uh, commencement speaker for the May commencement is Mike Calbert, and uh, Mike is a um, an alum of SFA, and he is uh, uh, the chairman of the board with uh, Dollar General. And uh, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to talk with him and see some of the comments he has on his speech, and I think people will find it. Uh, um, especially helpful and uh, important during during uh, this this time. So uh, that's it. And uh, if anybody has any questions, Tim, Donna, any questions for Dr. Gordon? Well, if you have any, just feel free to reach out. Well, Dr. Gordon, we want to thank you. We realize that these are uh, for all of us, uh, busy times, and we really appreciate you and all the other participants for uh, taking the opportunity to join us. I don't think that Larissa is on the phone, but I just want to make sure. Larissa, are you connected? Larissa Philpott? Well, I do know that the next presenter is on the phone, and that's uh, our Director of Communications from the Nacogdoches Independent School District. Good morning, Les. How are you? Good morning, Wayne. It's good to see you all. Um, right now in Nacogdoches ISD at uh, Nacogdoches High School, our hybrid graduation ceremony is taking place this week, and that's where Dr. Trujillo is this morning. All of the diploma presentations are being filmed and will be streamed online at 7 p.m. Friday night. And uh, Hopefully by uh, Friday morning, we will have on our website and social media sites the link to be able to view those presentations. On Thursday night at 7 p.m., there will be a parade for the NHS class of 2020. Students will gather in the parking lot of Dragon Stadium at 6 p.m. and will decorate their cars while school staff ensure all social distancing requirements are met. The parade will begin at seven and proceed out onto Stallings Drive, then turn onto Appleby Sand Road, and then onto Moroni Drive before finishing up back at the stadium. The community is invited to watch the parade as well while following all social distancing measures. The district's academic calendar comes to an end on Thursday, that's May 28th this week. At that time, all distance learning programs in the district will be completed. The district is going to begin its summer school program in July, on Monday, July 6th. Final plans for our summer school program are still being completed, and uh, Texas public schools have been given permission to hold in-person classes for summer school with uh, some uh, social distancing requirements in place, such as no more than 11 people in a classroom group. Delaying the start of summer school until July 6 will provide a much needed break for our teachers, students, and importantly, their parents. And then finally, our school uh, student nutrition program will continue with its meal program this uh, summer. That will continue in place uh, beginning June 1st with the five locations for curbside pickup on Mondays and Wednesdays. And all of that information can be found on our website at NACISD.org. Wayne, that's all I have. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Les. I appreciate that. Any questions of Les? Okay, what's that have to do? Nancy Windham, I see you on the phone call. Would you like to add anything this morning? I'll go in and republish it. Okay. But we got one. If not, uh, and I send you Nancy, did you hear me? Okay. Just one second. I'll refresh it anyway. Nancy, your phone is on mute. Larry's doing really good. Logan is here helping and watching. And Can you hear me now? Dylan yes. Adding on to the barn and he's. Okay. Yes. Is this clear to you? Because it's real jumpy here. Okay. Just wanted to remind everybody on our website will be posted the support information for the Sabine River Authority Marina and Resort. Uh, they're filing for a permit. That would be a huge um, uh, improvement of one that's in Shelby County and then a whole new recreation area that's in Sabine County. It will be a great addition economically for our whole entire region and for the state. Donna McCullough uh, spent Friday out there with the team making some interviews. If you go to KTRE TV, you'll see some live coverage of the project. So I would encourage everyone to go and support if you can write a letter. That would be helpful in support of that project. Um, I also have received a couple of emails this morning from Senator Cornyn's office um, about the COVID, some of the CARES Act that can be filed now. And we're sharing that on the Texas Forest Country um, Facebook page. So go in and like us and you'll see the information there and, or it'll also be on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Any final comments from anybody? If not, let me just, uh, first of all, close out the meeting by thanking all of our presenters and all of our participants here today. Uh, I can't tell you how much uh, uh, value I, I've had feedback about your presentations and uh, and your willingness to share and ask questions. And uh, I also want to take a moment and acknowledge our media partners. Uh, I know Donna's on the phone from KTRE, and I do know that uh, Daily Sentinel is well represented. Uh, I can't tell you again uh, how much uh, value your your uh, coverage has been, been to the communities that we serve. And uh, I know a lot of times we fail to appreciate uh, uh, the hard work that you folks put into it, but I do want to let you know. Having said that, I want to remind you that next week we're going to have a full hour. Um, we're going to give all of our presenters a break, uh, with the exception of the fact that we're going to have folks from uh, uh, from the Nacogdoches Medical Center come on board and give us a full hour of preparation and insight into this very uh, uh, challenging issue. And I think it will be extremely helpful for our businesses as we continue to negotiate the many uh, and various issues associated with COVID-19. So I'd respectfully ask you to put uh, uh, the a week from today at 10 a.m. on your calendar and plan on joining us because it'll be of great value. Again, thank you to everybody that participated here today. And at 10.50, I will acknowledge that we are adjourned and we'll stop the recording. Thank you very much, folks.